what we want to do is give your kid an allowance with the idea that they are going to be responsible with that money. And so the three kind of core money smart skills that I think are really important for kids to learn are learning how to save for goals, distinguishing between needs and wants, and then just making smart money choices. And they can really only do that if they have some kind of money. And they can get some money as younger kids from gifts, but that's not really enough. I think it's good for them to get an allowance and then start practicing with that money and making early money mistakes because when they make early mistakes, they're going to be much less likely to make the bigger mistakes down the road because now they've had some practice. Every time you get money, you are making a choice to do something with that money. Whether you get a dollar or whether you get $100,000, you're making choices. And the earlier the kids can realize that every time they get money that they're making a choice that can impact them, the better. This is the Personal Finance Show. Hi, I'm Bo Humphreys, and this is The Personal Finance Show. John Lanzo wants to help families raise money-smart, money-empowered kids so that they can live happier, more fulfilled lives. John is the creator of The Money Mammals and the author of The Art of Allowance. I want to tell you everything about The Money Mammals because I like them so much, but it's probably best that you listen to the interview and then go to YouTube and search for the money mammals yourself. Describing them as puppets who are in a band and sing and play songs about money just doesn't feel like I'm doing them justice. There's a Money Mammals DVD, three books for kids, and now for parents, the new book, The Art of Allowance, which provides an allowance framework to find the right way for you to set up an allowance system for your kids. There's also a companion Art of Allowance podcast where John interviews parents about their allowance systems and what's working or not working for them. The thing I notice most about all of John's money resources for kids is how well designed and produced everything is. From the websites to the videos, songs, interactive games and books, it's just an amazing collection. John joined me from Los Angeles to tell his personal finance story. So I guess my earliest money memory is actually tied more to not particularly money, but getting a gift when I was younger. It was instead of getting money from the tooth fairy, we actually got a gift from the tooth fairy. And I remember getting this Lego helicopter that I had been pining for for the longest time. Wow. And yeah, that's unique. So, that's a unique thing. I, I I don't think I've ever heard of uh, the, the tooth fairy uh, giving gifts. Yeah, it didn't happen all the time. And I'm not sure why this happened in this particular case. Okay. But I can visualize getting that I can I can remember I remember the box, I remember getting the helicopter, I remember I just remember the excitement tied to it. And it's it's my first memory, it's the first memory that I that I have of really like longing for something. I may have longed for something before that, but that's the that was the thing. I really wanted this Lego helicopter. It's just this kind of red emergency helicopter. You know, and that's back in the day where every one of the Legos wasn't shaped for you. So you had to kind of, you know, imagine that it, you know, it looked enough uh, like a helicopter, but, but it was it wasn't more as, boxy or it was, <laughs> yeah, a bunch of it was much more boxy. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> and, and then what we would do with Legos, we would just make them and then we would just, I would make them once and then I would crunch them all up and throw them in a box and then start making bigger and better things from those. Okay. Uh, I, I actually had a friend of mine who, who made his Legos and then he would just keep them on the shelf and, he he's the consummate collector so he 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 still has his lego his original legos and but i that was just not my thing i i i wanted this lego and i wanted to build it and then i wanted to be done with it and then move on to making some kind of weird frankenstein lego creation i i think people have those uh, policies when it comes to puzzles as well right i've heard yeah. of people who like lacquer their puzzles when they're done and <laughs> frame them or something yeah. Well, there, I don't know that that's right. I, I think 
it's about the building process. And in a year, you'll probably not have a good memory of that puzzle uh, and recreate. But in your case, you can make new things because it's just well, rectangles, right? Right. I mean, you can, I, you can you want. probably tell we, we were not, I'm not a puzzle lacquer guy. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably the first a... time you've ever said that. <laughs> it's, it is definitely <laughs> the first time I've ever said that. Awesome. But it's a good point. It is a good point. You weren't uh, thinking about like how you could buy this set uh, at this point. Did you have any money of your own yet? No, I don't, I don't recall if I actually had any money of my own and I did want to buy it. It just, okay. this was the, this was the shortcut to it. Sure. You know, we didn't have, there wasn't any kind of set. It, it's, it's, uh, there's a little bit of an irony here because, you know, my, my dad was a banker. Both my parents are very frugal. So I learned from them by watching the frugality, but I didn't, mm. we didn't learn anything from kind of intentional teaching about money that I really recall. So they were smart with money. They, they certainly weren't just, you know, spending money crazily, but there wasn't any intentionality. I do remember it. Like at some point we got some kind of allowance, but it didn't last that long. It wasn't really that there was, I didn't get, there wasn't much of an impression on that, on my kind of on my life in terms of what this is because it kind of came and went. It was a transient allowance. And I, and I think it's because they didn't really know what to do with it. They kind of thought, oh, we're parents. We have a kid. Let's give them an allowance, that type of thing. There's no actual plan in place. And jumping forward, then uh, you end up writing a whole book about allowance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I have written a book about allowance. And, it, and I think part of it was informed by just being, I think the purpose of the reason I wrote the book is that I want, I think it's important for parents to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. I think that certainly kids can learn from a good example. And my parents did set a great example. My parents are fantastic. They were very intentional about plenty of other things that were just as important, whether it's, you know, our interest in art and making sure that we took art lessons, or at least my particular interest in art, or whether it was sports teams. Uh, those weren't quite as expensive back then as they are now with all the crazy club soccer, you know, that that's out there. But they always, they, they were very intentional about that. So I don't want to paint any picture that my parents were <laughs> negligent in any way. I, I don't think it was as much of a concern in the 70s and early 80s because mm. you didn't really have to worry as much about what you were going to do financially because people kind of had jobs and, and then they'd, they'd have jobs that might pay a pension and they would be kind of taken care of to some extent. Uh, and even though, because my mom had a job with a pension, my dad did not have a job with a pension, but he made a fair amount of money because he was a banker. And so I think now it's a little different because it's really important. Our kids are going to go out into the world and they are going to have to really very much fend for themselves financially. There's no, there, you know, there's none of that that's going to be out there. Whatever social security is going to, that's going to be available, I'm not sure what would actually be available, but it's certainly not something you're going to want to count on as uh, what you're going to live on. So it's really important that we, much more important now that we are intentional. The other thing was when I went to college in the mid eighties, that was the beginning of when they started throwing credit cards at kids. Mm. That didn't really happen before. And so I think that's part of the reason that it just wasn't, I don't think my experience was uncommon. I think generally parents weren't doing a lot in terms of teaching their kids um, aside from what they were showing them in terms of their own behaviors, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes total sense. And I guess it, it sort of answers my, my follow-up question. And I am jumping ahead. We'll come back to, to you uh, as, a, as a young person, but... <laughs> uh, the the question that comes to mind is what is the purpose of allowance? The purpose of allowance is really to teach kids to understand how to use money as a tool. That's ultimately what you mm. want to give them. You want to give them some practice with money and an allowance is the way to do that because there's now real strong research that suggests the importance of experiential learning for kids and it's not really, I think it's kind of common sense for, for us to, to realize that a kid is going to have a tough time learning about money beyond anything that's just abstract without actual money in their hands. And so what we want to do is give your kid an allowance with the idea that they are going to be responsible with that money. And so the three kind of core money smart skills that 
I think are really important for kids to learn are learning how to save for goals, distinguishing between needs and wants, and then just making smart money choices. And they can really only do that if they have some kind of money. And they can get some money as younger kids from gifts, but that's not really enough. I think it's good for them to get an allowance and then start practicing with that money and making early money mistakes because when they make early mistakes, they're going to be much less likely to make the bigger mistakes down the road because now they've had some practice. Yeah, I, I love that concept of making mistakes early when, when it doesn't really matter, you know, it, it, you know in, yep. the, in the whole scheme of things, right? It's, you can really mess up when you're a kid with your allowance or whatever amount of money that you've saved up, and it's not going to ruin your life. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I, had, I read it, I was just reading a, a paper on experiential learning recently and they were I, I may have the numbers wrong but they're saying you know it's like a, a mistake for a five-year-old is five dollars you know a mistake for a 15 year old is you know fifty dollars a mistake for a 25 year old is can be five thousand or more dollars yeah. you know it's and that's and actually i think the and the, the big danger is when kids are going off to we're, we're having them make a you know six figure decision about college. That's crazy. And if, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's a big monetary decision. And, you know, they, they should have, you know, they should have some idea of what they're getting into. Obviously if they're taking loans. They should have some idea of get, what they're getting into, but they should have some idea of the money. You know, if you are, are fortunate enough to be able to pay for a portion, if not all of the kids college, they should have some respect for what that, you know how much the how much this education is costing them yeah and or costing you and uh, allowance seems like a good way to get them started early okay so we'll get back to that and we'll talk about the book a little later sure. uh, so now you <laughs> you got your lego set uh you got that from the tooth fairy and <laughs> when is when is the first time you remember getting money of your own i, I mean maybe gift uh other than the the casual allowance uh maybe or gifts what about uh, or like earning your own? I do. Uh, one thing I do remember was going to uh, the savings bank. It was Carteret Savings Bank, which I don't think exists anymore in my hometown of <laughs> sure. Caldwell, New Jersey, okay. and getting the passbook. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and then that was that was really exciting because they would print <laughs> it out, and I, I think I, I think I don't even remember how I got the money for that. That probably was. That may have been when I started doing work as a camp counselor in the summers. Okay. Um, I'm not I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I do. You'd see the balance, and then when you go and take the money out, you know this was and and ATMs or they were called Max in our area, so money access centers. They were and now they're just you know ubiquitously called ATMs. But yeah, they were I think called, do they still call them Max in certain states? I feel like I've seen this. Is it a New Jersey thing to, to call them Max? Though the first one I saw in New Jersey was called a Mac. It was called it was a money access center and a friend of mine uh had access and the odd, the odd part about it is the friend who had access to the money access center was the biggest his family was the biggest group of luddites out there i mean they <laughs> they were the last to get a computer the last to adopt cable tv yeah and somehow he's getting money out of a money access center and i can't get it <laughs> it was starting to transition they weren't they certainly weren't everywhere you only you had to belong to only only certain banks had them available and uh and my my bank did not have that available and so i had to you know i had the printed passbook and I had to, you know, if I was going to get money out, I had to go physically to the bank and get that money out. But it was fun to watch and see your, you know, your, um, well, it was not fun to watch your uh, balance go down. It was fun to put some money in and watch it go up. Mm -hmm. And so do you remember, uh, did you have any goals for, uh, for your savings? Like at that time? No, I had zero goals for my savings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd, I'd but love you remember to say having the money. I remember having the money and I remember, you know, wanting things, but I, I really had no goals for what I was going to do with that money. So do you, do you remember what you would typically spend money on? Like, so this is probably you're a teenager and throughout high school. Yeah. Teenager through high school. Um, we, <laughs> stuff that would be the best yeah, way I, that, that's what we spent stuff. money on yeah <laughs> yeah well i'm from new jersey so we went to a mall we went to the mall a lot yeah. and you know this we would go to the mall we would play we would go to the arcade so yep. that's one thing i would like to use the money for was go to the arcade and 
my friends and I would go, I don't know why we did this, but there was a place called Koenig Art Emporium. And every time we went, we wanted to get some kind of pen. Well, I was, I was an artist, so okay. I like to get kind of cool pens, whether they're pens that had really fine lines or they were the color Pantone pens. Like I always wished I could have a full set of color Pantone pens. You yeah, know? this is like um, an artist's dream, right? <laughs> oh, it's totally. I mean, you walk in that store and just, it was... You know, it was like the Apple store for art. And yeah. it was just so exciting to be able to, you know, I, and I, I only had enough money to, to get, you know, one pen every three trips to Coding Art Emporium. <laughs> I think this is the first uh, saving up for pens uh, story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I do know what you're talking about because I had a very similar store uh, right near, near my house because I, I lived uh, next to the uh, Ontario College of Art and Design. They had so many pens and I was just confused. <laughs> yeah, you're like, what do I do with all these pens? I had specific things I wanted to do with the pens. I like to do, you know, lettering and I, I mm -hmm. like to draw. So I, I, I had reasoning for getting these pens in most cases. And we're talking about like, what, a $5, $5 pen maybe? Is that an expensive one? Yeah, the, I think like the Pantone ones were in that kind of three dollar. I think they were like two or three bucks each. That's a lot and of arcade games. It's you... a lot of arcade. That, that's a that, see. That's exactly the correct point. Is <laughs> uh, you know if you if you went there before the arcade games, you get the pen. If you went there after the arcade games, you're much less likely to get the pen. You're just looking at <laughs> you're just looking at them and and dreaming. Yes, so, you just or you just drew, you know I just threw all my more all my money into Gauntlet and. Uh, yeah, I just got, <laughs> just got, got the high destroyed. to get the high scores. <laughs> right. The so so did you end up going into art uh, in terms of school? Well, I was a bio major when I went to school, but I was we didn't have an, a minors, but I was essentially an art minor when okay. I was at school. Yeah, yeah, and and so uh, how was school paid for in your case? Well, I was fortunate that my grandfather helped contribute some money to that, and then obviously my parents, and I took out a small student loan as okay. well, but a pretty small student loan. I was, I was very fortunate in terms of my parents uh, being able to, to help with our school, and school was less expensive then. And did you get hit with the, the, the credit cards at, uh, when you went to the school? Oh, yeah. I remember, it. I, I remember my first credit card was uh, MBNA. Okay. And yeah, yeah. again, I don't know if they're around either. I think they may have converted. They've, you know, they, yeah, they, they may have. Their credit card know, company uh, in Canada, anyway. And in fact, it was with that MBNA card once I finished college that I drove across. So I was coming out to LA to get into animation, and I was a friend of mine, one of my best friends uh, from New Jersey. Once we finished college, we decided we wanted to come to LA and we just, he had already gone across the country, across the US. So we said, let's go across Canada. Okay. And so, <laughs> so we went up to Montreal and just, whoosh, and then took across to, and, and drove uh, west. Wow, and all the way. All the way, and it was a terrible time yeah. to come across Canada. But what month was it? This was it was it was not it was a good time during the it was it was uh, July. Okay, okay. so That's, yeah, it's a perfect time for weather. But what what was the problem otherwise? The uh, the exchange rate was horrendous. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> so it was a terrible idea. Well, there's a number number of bad choices here. So the exchange rate was terrible. I pretty much put everything on a credit card oh, <laughs> yeah, wow. on the way over because I didn't really so have any worse money. rates probably. Oh, it was, yeah, there's, there's just, just one bad financial decision after another, but you know, it got us out here and, but that's that, but that's the consequence of having not really being taught kind of what money is all about, how these credit cards work and then having the credit cards just given to you. Yeah, as a college student, and because it, it, it seems like it's free money, right? And right. it does. Then that you have some obligation to spend it. But you you get your degree in biology. I did. Yeah, I got my BS in biology. Okay. And I just the reason I didn't end up using that was that I I, I really enjoyed. I did my senior thesis in the lab, and yeah. I I it was great. I I, I worked on. I, I did a very extensive senior thesis with this apparatus and dealing with rats. And I mean, it was a whole <laughs> big to do. I remember doing a presentation for it at a conference in, I went to school in Maine and 
but I just looked around and I said, I'm not the, per I can't spend my life in a lab. I loved being in a lab, uh, for my college experience and I loved doing the thesis, but I just could not see myself being a lab person for the rest of my life. And I didn't really, I didn't like on the chemistry side, I didn't really want to go into medicine. I originally thought I was going to go into medicine, but decided um, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so that's where the bio comes from. Then you are using your art skills. You're going to try to find a job in animation. Yeah. So <laughs> what I, so I came to LA thinking I was going to get on the, get into the art side. But when I got here, uh, the first guy I met happened to go to my, so I went to Bates College in Maine, mm -hmm. and we happened to have one alumni who worked in animation, and he happened to be a director. So I went and saw him, okay. and he said, uh, so he's like, have you ever worked in animation? No. I said, have you ever, have you ever done, have you ever animated? I said, no. <laughs> have you ever kind of painted backgrounds or drawn layouts? I was like, No. And they looked at my kind of weak portfolio and he said, <laughs> he said, well, we don't really have anything for you here, but here's a list of places that you can go talk to that are in the area that might be looking for a production assistance. Okay. <laughs> Through that, I found my first job. And, uh, but I ended up not getting into the art side. I ended up getting into the production side and then eventually producing a few uh, television shows and, and direct video movies and stuff like that. So I, I, I didn't really use the art side of animation um, when I first got into L.A. So you started as a PA for just uh, like a small movie or a TV show? It was actually for uh, Baby's Kids, which was it's, it was a, a, a movie that was the first kind of uh, movie, first animated movie featuring an African-American star. And it was Robin Harris, although he had passed away. So a guy named Faison Love did his voice. Um, so it was kind of a little bit of a posthumous um, tribute to him. Okay. It's called Bebe's Kids. It was a great movie. Um, Paramount distributed it. And uh, I was, it was just, it was really fun to work on, on that movie. And then I eventually, then I worked, probably the biggest show I worked on was a show called Life with Louie with Louie Anderson. So I produced yeah. that show for its I first two seasons. Was what, so what year is this then, uh, the Louie Anderson uh, year? That's 94 is when the yeah. first, yeah. It, 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 st it premiered in prime time, uh, but it was a kid's show. So it was on Fox Kids um, after we did a Christmas show that premiered in primetime that was kind of a send up on the Christmas Vacation movie. And then then it, then then we did a few seasons uh, that were on Fox Kids. OK, so you kind of you, you kind of stumbled into the <laughs> this business. I, yeah, I just keep stumbling into various <laughs> things. Okay, so let's let's uh, break and and how are your finances at this time? So you you racked up the credit card debt. You still have a little bit of school debt. Yeah, I still I don't remember when I uh, paid that off. It was not a substantial amount, so I was paying it off as I went. And as I've uh, so I, I paid off that credit card slowly, and but then I made the the brilliant choice to pay for a computer on the, cause I, I felt like I had to get this computer cause I was, I was doing a side hustle in graphic design. Mm, okay. And so I had to buy this gateway 2000 computer. I oh, had yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. I remember those. <laughs> yeah. Remember those? <laughs> this was, this was like a 486. This is a high powered Ooh. 486 computer using Corel draw to do all my, uh, Design work, <laughs> yeah, Corel, not even a company anymore, right? Right, <laughs> not doesn't. I mean, I think almost <laughs> everything I've I've listed out doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> except right. except Lego. Lego exists. Yeah, so we got the computer, and I paid for that on credit card like yep. a genius. Yep, <laughs> and it was roughly two thousand dollars, and in the end, I ended up paying close to three thousand bucks when all was said and done, and interest wow. payments on that. But it was once I paid that off and paid off the student loan debt, I was pretty much done with ever paying any interest on any kind of credit card. I kind of did learn my lesson after that. Okay, so you you stabilized with the credit at that point. Uh, are you, were you making okay money as a PA, though, to start? Yeah, once I became a producer, I not, PA, not really, but but enough, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, this is the thing. It's like it was kind of a windfall mm. and be compared to what, because I was a camp counselor before that. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's I really made so little. It was it's incredible how little money you make as a as a camp counselor. So when you're starting to make actual weekly money, 
that's that's close to what you were making monthly, if not yeah. for the entire summer, you think you're rich. How long was the path between first starting as a PA and then becoming a producer? It was pretty quick. I was really fortunate to have a boss that gave us opportunities that, in all frankness, we did not deserve. But he saw promise in the work that you know that I happened to be doing, and he gave me the opportunity to produce this show. And and really, <laughs> I was not ready for it. But you you know you learn trial by fire, and he he liked what I was doing and gave me that chance. And you know once you're getting to be a producer, then you're making decent money. But when you don't have the context for having really dealt with money and mm -hmm. thought about money. It's so easy to go in and out, particularly when you're in a place like Los Angeles. It's just very easy. I remember, you know, I'd be at a friend of mine who was a composer's house who's, who was making oodles of money and talking about the finer things. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, you need to have the, the, the nicest watch and the nice that. And, you know, when I think back on all those, all the kind of conspicuous consumption, it's, it's really that, that questing for stuff that is the big problem. Because once you eliminate that, once you realize that it's the quest for stuff that's the problem, then you're not compelled to spend your money. But it took me a long time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Your parents didn't have a big concern, right, about they could probably buy stuff and and right. be comfortable and they weren't thinking that you would have any worries with that and they maybe they didn't know that you would move to LA either where, <laughs> right, where the right. finer things are even <laughs> more expensive right where you need to have the finer things did you were you up and down like buying everything that you uh, you could for uh, for years you know, it's it's less about that. It's probably more spending money you know, in bars and sure, you know, going okay. out with friends. I think that's where the money went, and it was certainly conspicuous consumption as well. Just not just not really thinking through it. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are certainly things that I learned just from watching. Like my dad never had a new car, and I I have I have leased some cars in the past, but now I have you know a Honda two thousand two, and I I don't care. My kids are always asking me to upgrade the car. I'm like, listen, you treat this car like an old sofa. So whether it's a, <laughs> a new car, an old car, it doesn't matter. So, and as long I'm as it's safe, this, right? Right. The car. Yes. Okay. So I can't click a button and open it from out from inside. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my first car out when I was out here was a used car and I never got anything like, so on the car side, I never really got, I remember buying, I did get a new Honda Accord and a friend of mine says like, why don't you just get a BMW? So you drive up to the club in an Accord. You look like a putz. And I said, I'm like, well, that's <laughs> maybe I'm just a putz. Yeah. <laughs> so, maybe I'm okay with that. Yeah, maybe I'm okay with it. So there's certainly things that you learn about the value of things and the value of money, even when you're, when people aren't intentional, if, if you're, you know, for example, your parents are at least being frugal about it. So when did personal finance or, or finance in general? Uh, become more of a, say, priority or interest for you? Obviously, it's something that you're very involved with now. Yeah, two things. One, uh, meeting and marrying my wife because okay. she okay. has she she's like been a saver you know, from day one. She's just, she's the aunt who would give savings bonds. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to her nieces and nephews. And, uh, and somehow she's still the cool aunt. I don't know how that is, but, uh, <laughs> She that she was that kind of person, and you know she bought her first car in cash. So it was really meeting her because I realized she was just such a, an amazing saver. We when we bought our first house, we bought a duplex, so we rented out the front half. So I started we started making really smart money choices. Okay, okay, and mo moving from from making a lot of really stupid money choices to making smart ones, and then obviously once we had kids, then we both realized that we really wanted to uh, teach our kids to be smart with money. And as we looked into it, we realized that the there wasn't as much research as there is now. And there's certainly not, you know, there's still certainly more research to be done, but it became very clear that kids can and should learn early. And there really wasn't anything out there that we saw that was really teaching kids or making it fun for kids, taking a dry subject and making it fun for kids. And you know, I had been just burning to do my own thing. 
um, having, you know, worked as a producer on projects, I was always kind of helping others do their mm -hmm. own thing. And, and I worked with incredible artists, but I really wanted to do my own thing. And I kind of had this character that I had been thinking about Joe, the monkey who ended up being the star of the money mammals. And we just came up with this idea of the money mammals, which was a way to get kids excited about things like sharing, which is charitable giving and saving and spending smart with songs and with characters that they could fall in love with. And that was really the beginning of, of my foray into kind of youth financial literacy. And, and so being a, a producer and having experience making TV shows and, and such, you knew how to uh, well, you're and you're an artist, so you design these uh, the the puppets or the yourself. Yeah, so I came up, so I drew the characters, yeah. and then, and 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 I should say, so you know, one, it was this the idea itself, generally it was something my wife and I came up with, and then the songs. I the one one of the things I learned from my boss, my original boss uh, back in animation, was he said, if you ever develop a project, be prepared to be in love with that project for at least a decade. Mm. So don't develop something that you're not going to be in love with for a decade. Don't waste your time because it takes a long time to sell things. And that the reason I bring that up is that I wanted to make sure that the songs that we did were songs that I was going to love. And so I reached out to my brother who happens to also be a stockbroker, but I said, I, I knew I, he was a, he's a hilarious songwriter. And I okay. said, he's not going to write precious kind of kid songs. He's going to write good songs. Okay. Okay. And that, that, that was why. And I still, I, I, that was probably one of the best decisions I made because he, I, I, today I still love listening to the songs. You know, I'm not sick of them. It's not, they're not precious kid songs. They're just fun, you know, songs. Yeah. Um, I, I like the songs. They're, they're actually really catchy. <laughs> yeah, they do. They stick in your head. And, uh, and I could take very little credit for that. That's, uh, that's my brother. And then uh, another fellow that I work with, Randall Crispin, he, he arranged everything. And you know, I had worked with him in animation. So I, I've, I've been lucky to have just I've worked with amazing people. So if I have an idea that I can't execute on, like so I can draw the characters, but I can't make puppets. So I found a really good puppet maker. And then I found great puppeteers. And actually, before we did, before we found the puppeteers, my wife, my brother and I thought we could do the puppeteering. And we created one of the worst video puppet pieces in the history of, <laughs> of Does this puppet exist nation. somewhere? Can, can we see it? Oh, it exists. Uh, you can't see it at some point. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is when, when we did, when we finally redid the whole script and, and I brought in um, real puppeteers, we did a, sh a screening for the puppeteers and before before I played the actual show I played our version of it which they had not seen okay and it took about a minute for a of stunned silence for them <laughs> finally Andy Hayward who plays pigs the bank in our show he's like what the heck is this <laughs> It, but it really went for like a minute because they didn't. Nobody knew what to say. Like this is garbage. What what happened to our work? But if we hadn't done that original kind of pilot, we really may not have ever done anything because you just have to kind of jump in. And we realized, yeah. okay, well, certain things did work. Like we took the characters, we shot them on green screen, and we were uh, able to make that work. It's just the performances were terrible because we're not puppeteers so it did it worked in the sense that we realized okay we have something here we have a little we have a, a core for a story and then i brought in someone to help me with the story so that really helped me revamp the script and that became the dvd that's that's currently out as the money mammals okay so just to wrap up uh, your your personal finance and i want to continue on the money mammals and uh <laughs> and and your book you were doing okay with money but maybe you just didn't have any plan Maybe you're burning through a bit too much of it and, and you didn't have any purpose. And then you meet your wife and and you're able to sort of direct it into yeah. property investment, maybe other investments and then this business. Yeah. I mean, that's we just started to get smart about money. I mean, the, the house was the first thing. And then obviously just getting our head straight in terms of investment and planning for retirement and figuring out what we're going to do with our kids. You know, my, my wife just makes continuously good decisions. Like for example, she started a 529 immediately. As, Which is uh, uh, in Canada, that's a registered education savings plan. 
That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> that's uh, so here we have the five twenty nines, and and that's just that's something that kids can use for that's for college education. Exactly. It's it's great. It's a great vehicle, and it's something that every parent should do as soon as possible. Um, whether it's what what is it called there again? It's called an RESP, so Registered Education Savings Plan. Okay. It's uh, we have very similar products to you. They just have uh, different names. Different name. Okay. Yeah. And it's great. And and what's nice about them is too too is now they will adjust as the kid. They'll get more conservative as the kid gets closer to college age. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. And that's uh, that's nice if you're trying to kind of autopilot as much as you can. And that's that's something that we try to do too. Yeah. We have companies that, that, that do it here uh, for you, or you can definitely just buy a bunch of ETFs yourself. And mm-hmm. uh, and just designate them as RESP under Got the it. RES uh, on the RESP. Like you can just buy whatever you want. Most mostly most things yep. qualify. I don't know if you can buy a bunch of gold, but <laughs> well, we have some good news, kids. We started RESP. We have some bad news. We set it up in Bitcoin. Yeah, so. exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and uh, yeah, I hope that it doesn't qualify. Though I am going to look into. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think cryptocurrency made the cut. But we'll uh, <laughs> we'll make sure of that for sure. Yeah, you would hope you would hope it didn't yet. Yeah, because the reason I I wanted to mention that explicitly that uh, is that you know a lot of people are doing okay in terms of of salary, but uh, the lack of direction and the lack of, of of plan actually makes them almost worse off than someone who is making just above poverty level, you know, because um, they just if you spend all of the money that you make, you're not getting ahead. And so it, it, in a way, like, yeah, obviously people who make more money are more fortunate, but if, if they don't have any financial education, they're actually almost, uh, you know, playing with fire uh, and more fire and they can get into even more debt, which is a little bit crazy when you think about it. Right. And not the good fire, not the no. financial, uh, financially yeah, that's right. independent <laughs> retire early fire. I keep fire. forgetting my acronyms, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fire is great. <laughs> Retiring early, financial independence, which yeah. it, then leads me to, to ask. Uh, so you're you funded all of this yourself, the money mammals. With Yeah. And I brought in some families as okay. well. OK. OK. Yeah. So there, you had people who are interested and you yeah. had credibility from your your uh, experience in the, in the business. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's and they, great. you know, and it's one of those ideas you realize it's it's something that people need. So it was it was yeah. uh, it just made sense. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so can you tell us about the? the there's four of them or five? There's four money mammals. Well, so what, are their, what are their names, and do they have uh, like a specific personalities, <laughs> uh, money wise, or are the, is it just whatever the context of the story is? They're all kind of learning, but their 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 personalities are probably. I mean, so there's Joe the monkey, and he's kind of the everyman. He's like the, the Luke Skywalker. He's okay, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and he's he's learning as he goes along. His friend Pigs the bank is a little anxious. He's he's probably more of the spender. Um, certainly in the in the in the DVD, he's the guy who really is trying to get Joe to to spend. But it's not that hard to get Joe to spend. He, mm, you know, yeah. He's just the pigs pigs the bank who also happens to be a piggy bank, but also yeah. uh, creates a lot of uh, creates a lot of uh, trouble. Is uh, is his friend, and then we have their their friend Clara J Campbell, and they're all in a band together. So yeah, I, I love that. <laughs> So Clara is really probably the sharpest of all of them. You know, she's got her head together. She's the one who introduces them to the three jar system, the share and save and spend smart. And then finally you have Joe's little sister, Marmoset, who is a little bit younger and just kind of figuring things out as well. And uh, but the fun part is that they're all figuring out money as they go. And the kids can kind of relate to both the successes and the mistakes that they're having. But most importantly, they just make money learning fun. And I, 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 the key thing is when I worked in animation, you realize that so much of what is done out there is to drive consumption. So even, you know, great, there's plenty of amazing shows out there but they just turn into vehicles of consumption, you know, shirts and... Yeah, and, so much, and, you know, yeah. Yeah, and so what we wanted to do was have a show that explicitly did 
that entertained, but then talked about not just spending, but spending smart. So thinking about it and then sharing and saving. And the spending smart really is important. People say like that just seems like a semantic trick or something, but it's, it's really important that you, that, for a kid to say spending smart, because one of the core money smart skills I talked about was making smart money choices. And so you just want to constantly be in their heads about this idea that when you are spending, just think about it. Even when you do think about it, you're still going to make mistakes, but just think about it. Because every time you get money in any regard, you are making a choice to do something with that money. You know, whether you're making the choice like I did to go across Canada and use money that isn't yours, or whether you're making the choice to buy a duplex and invest that money, you are making choices every time, whether you get a dollar or whether you get a hundred thousand dollars, you're making choices. And the earlier the kids can realize that every time they get money, that they're making a choice that can impact them, the better. Yeah, I, I I love that. You buy one thing, meaning you can't buy another thing. Or you buy stuff now, or you use your money now. You won't have money in the future when you need it. Those are right. These are great things. And and of course, you know, it's really hard to just talk to kids about these concepts. Did did have you, did you try uh, other things before uh, you you got to the money mammals? No, we really didn't because this this we started the money mammals when my youngest daughter was uh, my oldest daughter was six months old, yeah. so they really only know the money mammals and you know if we didn't have something like this, we might sit there you know i I bore them plenty with you know just just old guy stuff that you say to them sure so it's so it's nice to not be sitting there and going on and on about opportunity costs when you can just kind of yeah, use the reference right. of the money mammals because you say opportunity costs and their eyes glaze over yeah, they... you talk about <laughs> joe the monkey and they're like oh yeah red straw hat <laughs> <laughs> and he, look look he made that decision uh and right. uh, yeah and you're like that's opportunity costs and you're like <laughs> come on dad yeah. Like, stop boring us. We're watching yeah, exactly. this awesome You had movie. us. You had us at Red Straw Hat. No, <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> so the, the plan, was this to just dis make this DVD? Was that the original plan? Yeah, that well, the original plan wasn't so great. So it was it okay. was to make the DVD and, you know, capture lightning in a bottle and, you know, sell a million of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> which, that didn't work. So we, we interestingly enough, what happened was we joined a, there's a there's a group called Jumpstart uh which is a national organization that kind of uh promotes K through 12 financial literacy right and we joined them and they have a newsletter and we published in the newsletter that we were going to go on a little tour a mini tour of the west coast uh we had we had no dates we had nothing and so we put that out there that we're going to do it and then to some folks actually contacted us and they didn't realize that they were the tour now. And <laughs> one of those stops was in, uh, was in, uh, Oregon and it turned out to be a credit union. And when, when I was talking, this was back in 2007, okay. they wanted a program that could help teach kids, you know, in their local community, we decided to make that program, but we couldn't just make it for them. So we made a program that could be used by credit unions across the United States. Amazing. Yeah. And then, so that's really become our way to kind of reach out to all these parents and kids is through the, the credit unions will become partners with us. And we have a newsletter that goes out, you know, when the kids sign up, they get a membership card. They actually get one of those passbooks that I was talking about at some oh, of the credit still, unions. Eh? Yeah. Wow. So they still get those. And this is a great way for us to work with kind of locally based, socially conscious um, organizations to get this message out about sharing and saving and spending smart and saving for goals. And we've created, you know, we have a website with games on it. We've got apps. So it's really become something so much bigger than the original DVD. I've been lucky enough to, I've written three kids books now that tie into, they're just more stories about what the, the money mammals have learned. Oh, that's um, so great. Yeah. So, so, so if it, you, like, would you get the DVD? When, uh, is, that, is that part of the credit union? Right. It depends. Some folks will give it out. Some folks will give it out as like a promotional item. Some folks will give it out when people launch uh, or yeah. when people uh, sign up. It, everybody does it differently. Uh, we provide a lot of flexibility, and it really just depends on our different partners. 
Yeah, and so uh, and then if you watch that and then you find out there's books and then you can read those books. How how early are we talking about uh, for kids? Like how what's the earliest age you would recommend the money mammals to? Yeah, you can start kind of doing things with kids at say two or three. And really, the, the, okay. yeah. And the reason now that's it's important to keep in mind that you know for a two or three year old, what you might do with say like a three year old is when you go into a store, give them a dollar and help them through the purchase of something, right? They're mm. not getting any kind of allowance. They're not really making, they're making very kind of minor decisions. They're, they're really, all you're doing is introducing them to the vernacular of money and the way things work. They're not going to understand, they're not, not even going to understand the change they're getting back, but they'll start to, the, the best way to look at this is it's like in reading. So there's a thing in reading called emergent literacy okay. and that is it's it's the reason that we read to our kids from the time they're born is because we now know that the fundamentals the foundation for later reading and writing starts immediately and it's just you just expose them to words so you're exposing them to words they're not reading anything back they're not understanding what you're talking about but it doesn't matter. What you want is you want to expose them to language. Same thing here. You're exposing them to financial language, to finance, just everything that's tied to money from an early age. So it becomes just something that's part of their lives. And it's one of those things that helps break down the taboos. It's, it's very easy for you to have that conversation. There's no, there's no weight or shame involved in your conversation with a two or three year old. Whereas when you're, if you, if you start this conversation later, suddenly you're getting into investment and, and then, then you've got kind of in your head, Oh, am, am I a good enough investor to have this conversation? Mm. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You're talking about the simplest things with young kids. You know, we're talking about those, those three things. I'll, I'll, I'll bring them up again because I think they're so please, important. Please That's do, yeah. Saving for gold you know, making smart money choices and distinguishing between needs and wants. And that's the reason you start at that two or three is again, just to introduce them to the basics. So just say, you know, have them see you do transactions at the store, have them engage in a transaction. Don't have any, don't, don't have this feeling like they are going to uh, understand everything about money with these, but you're just introducing them to the basics. I mean, people who are adults still don't have these basics. So yeah. this makes so much sense to start early so that like it's it's almost second nature. That's right. That's right. And and it's it's almost second nature. And you, there's just a familiarity that you're that you're starting to mm -hmm. cultivate in them, you know. And I think just as importantly, the point I made before is that you're opening up a conversation and hopefully that will be an ongoing conversation. Taking the stigma out of the money talk, yes. which is yes. what still exists, which is really unfortunate that talking about money is still considered taboo for some. Yeah. And yeah, we need to take care, take care of that. So the, uh, the book then, did this come out of uh, the development of Money Mammals? Or were you just kind of inspired by all the things you were learning as you went along? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, the book, I, I realized that with the money mammals, so you get kids excited, right? Yeah. And so that worked if you were putting a plan in place because, because the kids get excited, but that's just getting them excited. If, you know, so we had a plan in place and I, you know, talked to other parents who, you know, I had consulted with, or I just knew they were doing other, uh, they were, they had started an allowance program. And it basically kind of paves the way for that. But if you don't do anything, the kids aren't going to necessarily learn anything. You know, they're mm -hmm. going to get these messages, but really the messages, the excitement then has to be followed up with a real plan. So that's when I realized I, I kind of needed to write this book, The Art of Allowance, to provide a framework for parents on how to create an allowance. And I also wanted it to be very, very flexible. That's why I call it The Art of Allowance, because my allowance system is going to be different than your allowance system is going to be different than someone else's allowance system. You know, there are core things that you need to do, but everybody's going to be different and everybody's going to have different values. They're going to be trying to get across with money. And so that's the idea here. Isn't, isn't to say, this is how you do it. It's to say, here's a framework to begin your money journey with your kids. That's perfect because yeah, the, I mean, I have a I have a kid coming very soon. Actually, by the time this airs, the kid will be here, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, everyone is telling us a million different things about how to do this or that, right? <laughs> right. And, right? And it's not even about money yet. 
Now imagine, yeah. imagine when we get in the conversation how to teach your kids about money. So this is, yeah. I, I like the way that you put it in that you're, because I'm sure uh, if you had one way to do allowance, somebody would say, oh, that's not going to work for me. So yeah. I really want you to say the core things again. Can you say them again? Yeah, yeah sure. So the, you know, the core, the core skills are saving for goals, making smart money choices, and distinguishing between needs and wants. Here's the other thing, Bo, that's really cool is that as a parent, when you start this program, you're going to realize that there are some times that you're not doing a very good job of distinguishing needs and wants, at least yeah, if you're exactly. me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, you help, it helps you. It, it's, it's a great way to kind of reflect on what you're doing. I've made, pl- I, I, I say this all the time. I've probably learned as much, if not more about money in the process of teaching my kids than they have. Yeah. Teaching is the best way to continue to learn, right? I, that's, yep. that's what I do as a coach. And, and, uh, you know, even the, this podcast is, is a great tool. And, and speaking of podcasts, so you, you made a podcast, um, uh, based on the book. I did. Yeah. I, in, in keeping with the book, I realized that cause I, as uh, the whole idea is that, Every family is going to be different. So I I created the Art of Allowance podcast and I talked to parents and money experts and in some cases both about what they're doing. The idea behind it is that as you're, if you're a parent and you're listening, you can pick out ideas that you think will work mm-hmm. for you and your family and you can ignore ideas that you don't think will work for you. But it's just to give give folks a sense of the different types of programs and ways that you can go about using your allowance program in an effective way that'll work for your, for your particular family. Now, this is awesome. Yeah. Cause that's what I want for people listening to this podcast is just be able to pick out the things that work. Right. And yeah. how, hearing from people and hearing stories, I think is the best way to be able to relate to that. So, okay. So the art of allowance, the book it's available wherever you get books, right? Uh, Amazon, yes, you can get it at or, Amazon, or you can go on theartofallowance.com. And and then the money mammals, you can only do this program if you're in one of the uh, American credit unions that you, you're talking about? Yes, you can also, at theartofallowance.com, we have a kind of family uh, pack that includes the DVD oh, great, and the, the DVD, Art of Allowance yeah. book and the three kids' books. Okay, great. So go, yeah. go to the, the Art of Allowance, and then you can find the... And there's a couple of teasers on uh, YouTube. Uh, if yep. you want to see uh, the the some of the songs are are great, <laughs> and can you can you meet the money mammals? Am I am I making that up? You can. We've done it. You know, we've done some tours with some of our partners. We've actually yeah. been to we've actually been to Germany. So we work with. Uh, That's great. S- yeah, it's it's super cool. We've been to so we work with Service Credit Union, which is New Hampshire, and they they have branches on the bases in and uh, base bases in Germany. So we've been to New Hampshire. We've been there. We've been to various places with the Money Mammals, and th- I, those shows are just awesome because we do the full live puppet show. It's interactive. The kids really get into it. Uh, it's those are super fun. You must have to play tracks for the songs though. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. They, I mean, they they come out and play. Oh yeah, the the. <laughs> if you had the, a live band behind each puppet, <laughs> that would be that would be awesome. But I'm just that was my guess. That would be awesome. That actually, my my dream is to do a kind of full stage show version of them, kind in, of in uh, costumes, like yeah, um, in costumes and yeah. stuff. Like, I think I think that'd be a fun thing. Like it's something we've talked about. It just right now the 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 puppet version is really fun to do that at schools. But I would I'd love to do a full stage show because I think that could be really impactful. Oh, so cool. Okay, well, I, I'm going to definitely keep uh, trying to support that concept. <laughs> so, uh, That's yeah, right, because well, you're a musician, right? Yeah, I am. I am. I yeah. love the idea of, of, well, number one, I love the idea of, of financially based songs uh, that are <laughs> right. teaching. And for kids, it just all makes a lot of sense to me. It kind yeah. of wraps up all the things. Uh, this is actually the perfect interview to be doing as the last one before the baby comes. Right. Um, it does seem very apt, it, doesn't it's it? It's very appropriate, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thanks so much for uh, uh, accepting my reschedule from uh, from 2018 to 2019. Well, Bo, I appreciate it. This has been super fun. This is, this is one of the most uh, kind of different interviews I've done because I got the chance to really, you, you do a great job of really kind of delving into kind of what, has gone on to to make the money mammals the money mammals and yeah and I, I like the I, deep dive I, it, I, I yeah. think it just it just adds a lot of value and and we get to know you a lot better 
Yeah, I love that. This podcasts are all about conversations, so I've had a lot of fun. Well, thanks so much, Sean. Cool. Thanks, Bo. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or however you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave me a five-star rating or a review or both. If you're already a subscriber or you already left me a five-star rating or review, you're the best. Please join my Facebook group so I can thank you personally and find out who you are. To find the group, go to Facebook and search for The Personal Finance Show. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Personal Finance Show. I'll be back next week with former banker and the author of the new book, Beat the Bank, Larry Bates.